Hello, I'm Hunter Schultz. My guest today is a dual board certified family physician. In 2013, she founded Spark MD, a direct primary care practice in Boise, Idaho. The author of Spark's Start Fires, a guide for dreamers who are also doctors, she's also the president of the DPC Alliance, a grassroots nonprofit organization for direct primary care physicians. Welcome to the show, Dr. Julie Gunther. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it is a pleasure. And right off the bat, I have to congratulate you on the new book. Thank you. It's, I've, I've always wanted to write a book. I didn't think I would write a how-to book, but sometimes the best place to start is with what you know. And I know how to start a micro practice. So I put it down on paper and I hope it helps some people. Four years in the making? Mm, I, I started uh, my clinic actually, gosh, almost six years ago now, but I started writing down how to do it four years ago. Um, life, life got in the way a little bit. Um, and then I've been asked over and over again to edit documents and write how-to lists and answer people's questions. I've been sharing it for free as a Google document, and I finally thought, what the heck, let's just get it out there. So it was really a fun, it's been really fun, and people have been super encouraging. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I'm, uh, I'm a talker and I, I struggle to read. I don't love reading. So I've been told it's a fast read, even for people like me who really don't like to read as a hobby. So, so hopefully it can help some folks. Well, how did it feel to hit the publish button? Um, nerve wracking because I self published it, which I know ooh, we're sort of in that time in technology where I think there's still pretty high regard for people who go through traditional publishing routes. Um, but it's kind of like everything. If you're, if you're someone who's, who's designed to create, um, I just watched a really great movie. Um, I think it's called like, where have you been Bernadette or something, but there's a line in the movie that says, um, for people who are put on this earth to create, if you're not creating, you just end up being a menace to society. <laughs> so, so for people who create, there's always this vulnerability, right? When you put yourself out there. Um, oh. Yeah, and then, you know, in medicine and in a lot of professions, there's the saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So there's just a point where you just have to kind of throw it out there and get on with your life. Um, yeah. I was actually more nervous when I got my first copy because I thought, oh, no, what if I open it and it is all messed up? But it wasn't, so that's good. Well, I, I went online to Amazon. I opened up the, the little preview, and knowing what I know about direct primary care and health care. And I've had some great, I mean, terrific mentors, not to mention the guests that have been on the show. Yeah. Dr. Creighton Shute says hello. Oh. Um, he, was on a, he was on last month. And uh, so I, I, I saw the index and it was only the first of 20, first 13 of 20 steps. Uh -huh. And I thought, okay, if you are, if, if you're a physician, and you are thinking, you know, this direct primary care thing, I, I'm hearing a lot about it. This would be a good book for you to read. So I, I, if you read it, it's just outstanding. And, okay. and it outlines, it outlines how, basically how to start, build and operate your own DPC clinic in, in 20 clear steps. But my question is why only 20? <laughs> <laughs> me, there'd be a few more in there. Ran out of steam. No, there's um. So I have two daughters, and my youngest is really into the um, Catching Fire, Mocking Jay series um, by Susan Collins. I think is the author of those series, and she says my next book needs to be called Catching Fire, which is a title that's already taken. But um, I've always been really driven by the desire to not have other people have to work as hard as I have to accomplish the same thing. I think I don't know if if by nature I'm designed to be an educator or a motivator, but um, the first 20 steps were really all I could squeeze out of, of my writing abilities at the time. But certainly, you know, with the release of this book or releasing this document into the wild, my next thought is, well, there's so much more to say and there's so many more questions. And um, what I have loved about entrepreneurship uh, as a, a surprise, I guess, to me is, um, and I, I've said this when I've spoken before and I'm sure it's not my analogy, but but um, in the beginning, you see this mountain in front of you that you just firmly decide you want to climb and you gear up and you pack up and you start climbing it. 
And in the process of climbing it, the view changes, your needs change, your understanding of what you should have brought changes, right? Um, and, and so if you want to keep growing, you have to modify what you carry, where you're going. And then all of a sudden, maybe what was the top or the end goal or the view you were looking at from the beginning is not what you're looking at anymore. So what I've really loved about entrepreneurship, and I see it really um, goes hand in hand with medicine and primary care, is um, where you are tomorrow um, is the best result of the judgment you could make today. But it's okay if tomorrow you have to adjust your path because now you have more information, right? So, so book 2.0 or 3.0, if they're out there, I, as long as there's value, I'll just keep sharing my opinions and my experience. And um, I just hope it encourages physicians that if they really love medicine, they can, they can pave their own path and it doesn't have to be the 20 steps I did, but that's one path that worked. Well, if they're starting from zero, you know, they, they've, they've heard of it. And, and now, of course, we have COVID-19, which is making a lot of them go, whoa. Yeah. Um, it's, it's blowing through so much. But out of the 20 of those steps, which was the toughest for you? What was the, how did you, how did you overcome? What was the toughest and how did you overcome it? Um, that's a, that's a good question. So thinking, um, hard work. That's why so few of us do it. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, I'm, I've never been afraid of work. I'm a workaholic. Probably maybe it's a Schultz thing. I don't know. Um, but we were speaking beforehand how my uh, maiden name is Schultz. So the hard work isn't there. I also have learned that I'm super risk tolerant. Like I just, and I really, I don't like being wrong, but it doesn't bother me. Um, so, you know, this is very strange to say because I'm in a very different place now. I think the hardest thing of all of it, it wasn't believing I could get a bank loan with 200K in debt. It wasn't believing I was gonna buy the building I bought that looked like a mortuary for real and turn it into something beautiful. I wasn't worried about financial ruin. I wasn't worried about selling our house. I wasn't worried about leaving my job. I, none of that stressed me out. The hardest part probably, and I, I know, knew it was right, I knew it had value, but learning how to assign the value to it and ask for it. So the conversations with patients, the, I guess the, the angle of business around becoming comfortable with the idea that this model and my service in this model doesn't fit everybody's needs and that I don't have to make it fit everybody's needs because there's lots of healthcare options out there. And mm -hmm. that there are people who want me as their physician or as their provider who don't want the business model of direct primary care. So it, you know, I want you, I love you. I love how you've helped me. You've been my doctor, but I want you to take my insurance. And it sounds strange because that's something I've become so comfortable with now, but learning that I as a physician and a businesswoman can say, this is what I do, this is how I do it, and this is what I ask to be the person who provides that for you. And I, I'm not sure what step that is in there, because um, a lot of this book is really pragmatic, but that transition is incredibly empowering and very hard. Um, it's within the culture of being a physician. Very, very hard to say, I'm really comfortable with, this is all I can do, and I do it well, and if you wanna be a part of this ride, here's the terms, and if not, great. That's okay. Hmm. Well, I think a lot of doctors will take encouragement knowing it can be done. You know, you're, you're, you're proving the point that, you know, take the risk. Well, and that's, that's, that's my hope and the hope, you know, there's a, a gaggle of us more than a gaggle, I guess a gaggle's 12 or 18 or six, I don't know. But um, there's a, there's a group of just fiercely independent direct primary care physicians that have organized in the direct primary care Alliance. And it's my privilege to be president for the, this and next year. Um, and that's really our incredible passion is, um, you know, every day that we show up and open our doors, we're, we're demonstrating that for physicians who still love medicine and want to be doctors that you can, you can do it. You don't have to be owned. And I, I know that sounds really negative, but you don't have to do it within an employed construct. Um, and that there's a way to just be a doctor. And my fear, and you kind of touched on COVID, the COVID pandemic, but you know that there's two big, well, I would say three big divisions in medicine, right? There, there's people who are practicing in medicine who I think 
love it and the, the job that they're working is working for them mostly, um, whatever that may be. And then there's people who are probably untenably at the end of their rope and um, we really need to be mindful of depression and suicide. But, but there are people who I wanna give a message of strength to to say, there's a life beyond medicine. And in modern times, very few people start at the age of six or eight or 10 and commit themselves to a career path that they then hold themselves accountable to for the duration of their life. That's really what our culture expects of doctors, but it's, it's not required. So, so I run into physicians who are excited about direct primary care, but what they're really excited about is they're just barely hanging on. And, and so to empower physicians who need or want to leave medicine, it's okay. But then for those who maybe just need a break, but really still love the heart of the work um, and still have a place in it, to know that there's other models, right? So my fear with the, the COVID fallout among many, many things is that we're going to see physicians leaving medicine who had they maybe figured out there's a bit of a different business model a little bit sooner might have been able to sustain themselves in this career. Um, because I, I want people to leave medicine if medicine can't give to them what they need to care for themselves. Um, but direct primary care, at least for me, um, is a business model that's very far from perfect, but it really allows me to care for people in an authentic way. And that has provided so many returns for me um, that it brings me confidence and joy and it, it sustains me. It's empowering. It is. And it, it's fun to feel like a grown up. You know, um, it sounds weird to say that, but, but there's a lot about the culture of healthcare where the most highly trained people in our healthcare system are treated like in the most infantile way and, and it's demeaning um, and it's destructive. And what's cr most crazy about it is we have incredibly capable, incredibly tough, incredibly smart people who are in this really strange culture of abuse um, you know, my, my colleague, Kenneth Richter, a couple of years ago, he's a DPC doc. He called it Stockholm syndrome, basically, for, for physicians that, um, or the golden handcuffs or whatever. But, but sometimes the, the thing you know seems okay until you're out of it, right? Uh, a lot of us maybe had a bad relationship here or there in our lives, and it didn't seem bad when we were in it. But when you actually get in a functional one, you can look back and go, what was happening? And, and I think that's very much happening for a lot of our medical providers. Um, and they don't know there's an option. They don't know they can date somebody else. I, here's, you brought something up about ownership. And, and I'm thinking back to something that I've, I put in my book, which I'm now in Kindle Create. So I'm, I'm hey. right behind you. Hey. I, I, and that's the title of the show actually came from the book. The book is called Winning Healthcare Food Fights Without the Mess. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's in Kindle Create and I'm going through. So hopefully this month it'll be done because it's been about two years. And so one of the things that I, I mention in the book is how important it is for you as a patient to own the relationship with your physician. And I explain that with or by saying, look, you and your doctor in the exam room, that's the core of great medicine. And so you, you don't own the doctor, obviously, that's not the point, but by paying direct, the doctor's working for you. You know that, they're not working for a third party, they're not working for someone else. They're there for you totally. Am I, could I rephrase that differently or could I refine it differently or could I just refine that from your perspective? I haven't gone to press yet, but it really is about the patient and the doctor working together. And then you invite, whether it be a uh, cardiologist or a genetic counselor or whatever it is that you, the patient needs, it's between you and your physician. And your physician is the one that's guiding you and providing the expertise. But it's getting to the point now where, who are you working for? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the danger that I see. And that's why I put in own the relationship under the guise of DPC. I think 
and I've used that same, I've been a part of that same conversation for a number of years and I have been reframing that and here's why. I, I think if direct primary care does what it's absolutely most capable of doing, it is, it is capable of, of dramatically restoring our healthcare system to something that, that serves patients better and serves physicians. And so in the, in the process of educating about what we can do, I am always trying to be mindful that there's a ton of doctors that are my colleagues and my friends who are working in the traditional construct. My desire for service my the integrity with which I cared for patients, my incentives, my clinical thinking are not different in this model. I, I, don't, I do not believe I ordered a CAT scan in the employed model because I knew I'd get, you know, or they'd get more money. Like I, I know people say, oh, there's disincentives and you're not aware of them. So in a long-winded way, I try to make sure that when I'm talking about why direct primary care is, is valuable, I I do so in a way that doesn't ever imply that physicians working in the system aren't as good because the physicians and the providers, many, many of them are, are every bit as capable and ethical and hardworking. They're just encumbered by a business model that doesn't fully empower them to serve people the way they would if they had more time. So, so one thing to think about, one thing I've been talking about is, is, um, we have sort of this wave of consumerism over the last 10 years that, that makes very sexy um, using your dollar for good. So I think of brands like Tom's. Tom's shoes were very trendy for a while. Why you buy a pair, they give a pair to someone who doesn't have shoes. Um, I think what we hear about Costco all the time, really, really upstanding brand, known for paying its employees very well, keeping employees on for a long time, having great benefits. Um, we think about what happened with Hobby Lobby and, you know, not to get into a huge controversy, but, but they took a strong stance on what their insurance would and wouldn't pay for on behalf of their employees. And some people chose not to spend their dollar there. So across the board, we've seen this shift in consumerism where some people have said, I'm going to spend my money here because I believe this company uses that dollar for things I believe in. And now you can do that in healthcare. So in terms of taking on ownership, what I want to say is that if people are supporting the local grocer and the local coffee shop, and if they feel very strongly about spending your money locally, and they feel very strongly about putting your money in a place that makes the world better. With coronavirus right now, a lot of people are sewing masks and speaking up and applauding healthcare providers all at the same time. Well, one way you can applaud healthcare providers is Spend your money when you can control your dollar on a small independent healthcare provider. Now, if that person or that clinic doesn't serve you as well as the local hospital clinic does, then you know you should go where you're going to get the best care. But just because a physician doesn't work for a hospital doesn't mean they're not an amazing physician. And in fact, many of those physicians are, you know, some of our DPC doctors were professors at Duke. I mean, most of the direct primary care doctors in the US right now are are not sort of doing this because they couldn't thrive somewhere else. They're some of the top physicians, primary care physicians in the country in terms of clinical acumen. So, so a long-winded way of assuming ownership is not just to say, if you pay your doctor, then they only serve you. Because I would argue I've always only served my patients. But the more, the more directly you use your dollar, the more efficient and I would say explicit's the wrong word, but even within healthcare, you can make a change by being conscientious about where you spend your money. And if you can support an independent surgery center, an independent ophthalmologist, an independent, and many of these entities still bill insurance, but support independent medical providers because that empowers employed medical providers to see that independent medical care still works. Um, and then one by one, you know, patients, this sounds really silly too, but Speak up about your doctor, whether your doctor is employed or not. If you don't have a direct primary care or a direct care doctor, but you love your doctor, give them great reviews online because down the road that supports them also. Yep. Um, and it actually keeps them protected from some scrutiny from their employers sometimes. So, so, so you asked, you know, do we paint that picture a different way? I think so. Um, 
Um, the other thing I, I would say is your doctor, no matter what setting they work in, is a human. And, and what really needs to be understood is that um, your human provider is very likely having some very human experiences in an abusive employment situation. And what you see is that they're late or they're cranky or they didn't take time for you or they called you back to discuss your lipids that were normal face to face and you got a bill. But these things aren't your physician's choice, they're the system's choice. So also looking your doctor in the eye and saying, I've loved you, you've provided such amazing care for me for 10 years and the last two years have been terrible. You seem unhappy. I mean, you want to see a doctor kind of lose their crap and cry, but, but that kind of compassion and that kind of extension of, of honoring the relationship that person, the people have worked to build has value. So, so yes, people, people can change healthcare for the better by, by being thoughtful about how they use their dollar. Mm -hmm. You've, <laughs> Now I got to go. It'll be June now before the book comes out. I'm going to revisit that little part. Thank you, though. Well, I don't think that's a bad way of putting it, but I think it's, you know, I like to challenge people to be philosophically consistent um, and yep. don't often put healthcare in the same bucket as where we get our vegetables or buy our shoes. But um, and I do, I do make a, a number of points about owning a, Yes, owning the relationship, but keep in mind at all times, and I, may, and I, and I go through the processes of uh, healthcare, and essentially saying, look, before you blame your doctor, you got to look at what system they're in. And if yeah. they're in a, I mean, the, blame the system. That's the first thing. If you're going to blame something, look at the system first. Yeah, if, and I think you yeah. can gently, but you can, and I'm to the point where, at what point do you start to hold people accountable who work within the system for the system's failings? And, and, and that's because there's some, many doctors don't know different. There's fear, there's debt. But, um, you know, one other thing I think about an analogy maybe is, and I see this, but when your kid's flunking school, do you blame the school or do you start with like, what's going on with your kid? Um, and, and what I mean by that actually not is about the doctor, but is about the patient. When your health condition is not so great, is it the teacher's fault? Is it the doctor's fault? Um, maybe sometimes, maybe, you know, I've, I've had my own health events. I've been stuck in the quagmire of healthcare administrative nightmare as a patient. Um, but in terms of ownership, where patients can really take ownership is help your doctor um, by joint, you know, log on. If they offer you an online portal, use it. Um, if they have a phone that says, please press two for refills, use that. Don't call your doctor's office three times in sequence, you know, when they say he'll call you back. So there's a lot of human behavior around utilization that doesn't support efficient triage or doesn't allow even a small clinic to take great care of people because people aren't thinking about you're the one who's responsible for your care. You're the one who needs to remember when your colonoscopy is due. I can help. But I'm not going to tell you five times and send a certified letter and show up at your house and drag you there. So like you're responsible for your medication refills. So when there's three pills in the bottle, call me instead of none. And then you're upset that we can't transition it in less than a day. Right. So it's a little bit like we're awesome, but not that awesome. So help us. It's a relationship. Yeah. And, and in fact, it is just gave me a little a story that I will, I'm sure you can, relate to this um what you just said it was I, I think i was about 15 or 16 and i went to a 50th anniversary party for my best friend's parents and i was sitting with his mom and i said so how how did you do it i mean he he was a, a very he was on the board of amico oil in chicago so very high driven, you know, and, and she, she would tell the story of how he'd call her up at five o'clock and say, I'm bringing eight people home for dinner. Yeah. Huh? You know, she, didn't have, she didn't have Uber Eats then. No, <laughs> no. This is back in the 60s and 70s yeah. when it was funny, <laughs> you know. And I said, how did you, how did you do this? What, what's the secret for 50 years? And she said, it's real simple, Hunter. Marriage is a 60-40 proposition. 
You give 60, you take only 40 each. That way you've got a fudge factor of about 40% for those times when you get called at 5 p.m. saying yeah. I'm bringing home or you say something dumb or you, you know. Yeah. And I think that really kind of works. I would say that's kind of a nice analogy for the doctor-patient relationship. You as a patient have to be somewhat giving too and yeah. understanding because you're dealing with human beings. You yeah. both are. And, and it, by its nature, the relationship actually, I believe, is supposed to be mutually restorative. Um, and that is what has really been stripped out of it as we put up more and more and more boundaries. Don't talk about your kids. Don't talk about your life. Don't talk about yourself. Don't let anyone have access to you after hours. It's in it, like boundaries to the point where, you know, people will say, my doctor's like a robot. Um, Talk to the hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and doctors even are very fearful about opening that relationship up because people don't know what a healthy professional relationship where I get to act like a person too. Um, interesting sort of story, not story. I, I terminate care with people for three reasons. Um, if people lie to me because then I can't keep them safe. If people are mean, and I usually give people a chance on that, um, but, but unkindness wears on me more than anything. Um, and, and then if people don't pay their bills for a sustained amount of time, cause then I can't stay open. Um, I have a lovely, lovely patient who I've taken care of for quite some time. Who's a very gruff human and it's the nature of the business that they're in. Um, and yesterday I just sent a real abrupt kind of rude, uh, entitled short email to my private email, which is for emergencies. Um, and it came through first thing on the day that I try to take off for myself. Um, and this person's done this once or twice before, and this person feels really terrible. They've gone to an academic medical center who said my workup was awesome and they can't figure out what's wrong either. And that's so, such a terrible place to be, right? Like, sorry, even the experts don't know what's up. And by the way, you can't come back because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so I thought about it and I just responded and I said, I said, compassion is a form of compensation for me and I need you to treat me the way I treat you. And in 10 years time, I have never tr treated you unkindly. I've been infinitely patient and I've you know, gone very far beyond what most of us would expect. So um, mm -hmm. most doctors I think wouldn't do that, wouldn't say that. Um, and then the patient responded this morning and said, basically, oh my God, I'm really sorry. I was having a really bad day. I lashed out, you're right, I'm sorry. Um, and that, and he, he, it's a he, he could have been like, go, go, you know, go pound sand. Right. But, but it's, it cleaned things up for me. Now I'm not harboring any difficult feelings the next time I offer care for this person. Um, and it, and it create it, that's what sometimes starts to create a therapeutic relationship is the ability to say, I, I understand your suffering. I understand you don't feel good, but you don't get to come and poop all over my universe because of that. I'm, I'm working and I'm doing the best I can, but the disease you have and the problems you have are not something I created. Um, I'm merely here trying to stop the train from barreling down the tracks. Um, and I think extending that kind of thinking to more and more physicians and those kinds of relationships um, starts to make this job better for everybody. Mm. So if you could tell your younger doctor self anything, what would that be? Ooh. Um, I'm just going to be real, real, real honest. And this is not so good. Um, if I knew what I know right now and felt every bit of how I feel right now, I wouldn't choose to be a physician. Um, and that's probably not what you wanted me to say or not what people want. No, I, I, um, I've, I've been here. That's a trend that's disturbing. And yeah. I, 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 um, both of my children don't want to be physicians and it's nothing I've said. Um, although the, the real, this is going to, this will show my true side, right? This will show your audience the real me if you don't edit this out. I feel the same way about choices I made when I was younger. I didn't party, I didn't do drugs, I didn't have a lot of sexual partners, hardly any. In hindsight, if I could go back, have no drug problems, no arrests, and no STDs, I'd have way more fun. So, so like, but, but I can say that, I can say that because I have the privilege of being where I am, which is healthy, no unintended children, no big dramas that I created with mistakes or with decisions I made. So 
So I don't, I, I chose to be a physician because um, I was so frustrated with some healthcare that I had and some things I saw in healthcare that I saw has just repeated indign unnecessary indignities. Um, and so, and my husband said, you know, you talk about being a doctor all the time, either go do it or shut up about it basically. And I was like, okay, I will. Um, and, and I have served people with every ounce of love and compassion and pounds of flesh that I have to give. I'm not ashamed of the work I've done. I'm, I'm very proud of, of the stories I've been a part of and the contributions I've made. Um, but, you know, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2016 and there is no amount of data that can argue with me that I, I firmly believe my genetics plus what has what I have allowed to be done to myself emotionally, spiritually, physically in the process of becoming a doctor is what activated my tumor genes. Um, I had a super early delivery. My youngest daughter almost died. I had help syndrome. Um, and, and I've asked a lot of my husband, like a lot, like this is one of the most amazing humans on the planet. No question. And I don't, I don't think my story is that unique. Um, and so, yeah. So my wife. Yeah. So I know what your husband went through. Yeah. So the, the harsh reality, and this was an article another physician wrote maybe a year or two ago. Um, and you know, everyone thinks physicians are wealthy and well off, and we're certainly some of the most educated people on the planet, and no one wants to hear what they perceive as just whining, right? But um, but until we have a real uh cultural come to Jesus, so to speak, about what is happening to medicine, um, we're going to lose the most educated uh, segments of our society who, you know, 80% of the time, you don't need a physician. I have a great nurse practitioner, a great PA I work with. Your friend who's a nurse can probably help you. You can Google it and figure it out yourself, like maybe even 90% of the time. But, um, you know, my one patient who had the horrible shoulder dystocia where the baby got stuck in her birth canal and the baby had 30 more seconds before it had brain damage. And the old gray haired doctor came in out of nowhere and said, here's what I have to do after nurses and midwives and everyone else was panicking, came in, did it, broke the baby's arm, you know, but mom's fine. Baby's fine. Like baby's now a toddler. Like, that is one of those rare moments where you need the person who knows what to do because there's life altering consequences. So, so my rant is this, is that um, society broke its contract with doctors a while ago. And one could argue that in, in American society, people in places of authority broke their contract with society by, you know, egregious tax evasion and abuse of power and sexual harassment. And so we have a culture that doesn't respect authority doesn't respect earned authority through education, and I understand why, but there, we are going to pay a big price for that. Um, and, and the big price is that I really have a hard time convincing anyone to choose the path I chose because, um, you know, there, there's a lot of consequences of it. Um, I love surgery. I, I might have chosen to be a surgeon, but I know I'd be a single person now because that would have extracted an even bigger toll on my on my husband and my family. So, so the young me now, I would say, um, you are raised by a microbiologist and an engineer, and the things in their world that are jobs are not what you were made for. You are a creator. You will be a menace to the world with unfinished projects for the rest of your life if you don't create. And in 12 years, there's going to be this thing called Etsy, and you are going to rock it. So create, girl. That's what I would tell myself. <laughs> uh, well, lessons learned, right? 2020 hindsight. Yeah. And, you know, there's something that you, put, that you had in there. I had Dr. Pamela Weibel on the show. Oh, I love her work. Love her work. Yes. And, She's and, a brave, bold woman. I agree. And, and not, only, not only that, it's something that you said earlier that I really think is important. And, and doctors do need to hear this from their patients. You know, hey, doc, what's, what's going on with you? Yeah. You know, I really love the, I love the care, but the last couple of years, you haven't been the same. Are you okay? That's yeah. the right, you know, 
how are yeah. you doing? Yeah. Because this is getting to be un, an unimaginable situation. I'm not talking about COVID-19. Yeah. I'm talking about the system that a lot of physicians are in that doesn't respect them. It's, it's certainly not enabling them to do what they put up with for many years to get to you know, having an MD and being a practicing physician or yeah. DO. Yeah. Um, they're not living their purpose. Yeah. And I, I, um, I have two thoughts on that. One is my real struggle was I never got to the point where I felt like I could look at patients and say, this isn't my fault because I thought I have the license. I have the highest degree. My name is on the door. How do I then say my name's on the door, but I don't have any control over any of this. That was sort of the, like one of the deal breakers for me. Um, in the little book I wrote, I also have all these patient stories that I call my dominoes and I've, I've written them all and I've hes been hesitant to share them because they're not 100% my story to tell, but it was just patient situation after patient situation that I finally just said, you know, ethically, I can't stand here and be any participant in this because I can't control it. So I'm allowing it to happen. Um, but, but the extension of compassion to physicians um, is, is so much more restorative. So I, I would never have said, and I'm total Pollyanna optimist, idealist, like my mom and dad, when I said I was going to start this business, my mom said, you're going to give it all away. And my husband said, you have to promise me you'll bill people, you know, like minimum, you have to like, yeah. um, um, I would not have said, and I would not have believed that just being able to call your own shots and doctor the way you want a doctor would be compensation enough. And nobody does. The accountant that helped me start this business said, why would you map out a business plan that, and take on all this risk and be an entrepreneur for the same pay that you have now? Because my goal was, I'll just replicate the pay I have in the system, but gain freedom to care how I want to. Um, so to a certain extent, we need to be savvier business people and actually work on what our financial worth is, because we've got kids who want to go to college and stuff like that too. But, but honestly, I have, um, I have a stack like, probably this big of thank you notes and just little letters from patients. And I did a pap smear and someone sent me a fruit basket and said they'd never had a doctor be so kind and so gentle and just had an experience where it wasn't scary or threatening, you know, like, so, and all of that for me has brought me so much joy. And so it comes back to like, just saying thank you, just articulating to people who serve you, you know, just not being an asshole, but just saying like, thank you so much for helping my mom die peacefully. Thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you so much. I know you were running late that day. You know, any, any of that, um, patients need to understand like that goes so much further than you would ever imagine. Oh, <laughs> it's funny. This must run in the Schultz family because my <laughs> dad, I asked my dad who was a public speaker and a writer. Uh, he was an official U.S. Army war correspondent, World War II, an editor of Stars and Stripes. So he had, a, he had a very distinguished career. And I was probably three or four years before he passed away, and this is back in the 80s. I said, Dad, what are you most proud of? Aside from your family, I know, I know, okay, yeah. fine. You know, the typical, you know, parental. Oh, I'm most proud of my kids. And, he, and I said, professionally, what are you most proud of? And he said, you see that box over there? Go, go open it up and have a look. And it was a stack, and I mean the box was big, and yeah. it was full of letters. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Thank you for you know, a great motivational talk. Thank you for giving me you know, items to think about, the tools to become more successful, whatever it is letter after letter after letter and i got it yeah i got it it wasn't it was you know it was something about living as he was living his purpose as an educator yeah and I, and i also asked him if you could do it all over again what if you didn't if you couldn't do what you did what would you have done yeah and he said i probably would have been an episcopalian minister <laughs> You know, a few of my DPC colleagues are very um, beloved 
leaders within their religious churches. So it is, there is an overlap, right? It's advocacy, yeah. education, teaching, interpreting complex ideas and literature and making it apply to people's lives. Um, so I see that, like that makes sense. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That, that, so my original desire was to be an air force pilot, which you want to do like 180 degree turn. Um, and I, my dad recently said, you know, have, did you ever think about the fact that you might've had to kill people? And I was like, yeah, he's like, that's super inconsistent with what you do right now. Right. And I was like, you know, that wasn't, I just wanted to fly really fast. And at the time I was super fit and I loved it. So anyway, I have a lot of interests. Um, but I, I have, I have changed in my understanding. I, I was, I was and am raised by people who are very, who are planners, who are mathematicians, who are very exacting and, mm -hmm. Um, being a polymath, which is what I am, or a Renaissance person, um, I'm learning is a little bit unusual, and it's totally the black sheep thing to be uh, in a family of linear thinking, scientific, engineer types. I should show you, but my team gets me, my nurse practitioner gave me this, and this was one of the sweetest things anyone said to me in a long time, and it has reframed my own concept of myself. She said, I got this sticker and the first thing I thought of is this must be what Dr. Gunther's brain is like. And I'll see if I can show you. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. And, um, and, and until very recently, um, um, having that kind of brain was not something even in within medicine, right? Like um, having a brain that is just full of ideas and interests and varied abilities and, um, is not necessarily valued, right? Our primary care workforce. Um, some people think it's the hardest job in medicine. Uh, and I have always appreciated when specialists have said that. Um, and some people think we're just kind of flaky and weird, right? Um, I, don't, I don't need to be the best at anything. I love being really good at lots of things because I get bored really fast. And that's why primary care has okay. really suited me. And I love people, even though they aggravate the crap out of me sometimes. I still really love people and I love stories. And I think that's the recipe for a great primary care physician. And when you get yeah. to have those stories in those moments and have time to think creatively and have time to solve problems, that's where medicine is, is restorative. You, you just said something. It reminds me, I, um, Dr. Lewis, Lou Hoffman, who was a white house physician told me, the reason he loved family medicine was the fact that it, it enabled him to put on his Sherlock Holmes hat yeah. and connect dots and, yeah. you know, and, and, and primary care is like the center of connecting dots because you have all the dots there in front of you because you're looking at the whole patient, the whole someone, thing. Someone should write a Sherlock Holmes novel where Sherlock Holmes has seven and a half minutes to figure out the mystery or has to punt it to, you know, Watson. <laughs> Sorry, I can't figure it out, Watson. <laughs> uh, you said in, in your book, and, I, and I'll have the quote up on the screen here. Um, in the book, you said, in healthcare, independence is an act of defiance. I know physicians would get that, and you've alluded to it a little bit, but I don't think the public could really grasp that. So can you unpack that just a little bit? Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad that that's one of the lines you asked me to speak to. Um, so what's super fascinating, uh, I guess in the last probably 30 years, there's been a shift in traditional medicine to a very, very, very high regard for what everyone's calls evidence-based medicine. And just kind of like everything else, the pendulum tends to shift back and forth. So I am a scientist by training, um, but the absolute beauty of being a family physician or a primary care physician is the place where I work is where science and data meets an entity of one. And we don't gather science and data around one. We get science and data around a population. So to be a really great primary care physician, you have to be able to take in the data what we know about the masses, what we know about the population, what we're told we should do, what the standards are 
by a sitting board of declarative scientists who don't take care of people, right? You have to take all that in and then you have to have the confidence or the independence or the stubbornness or all of the above to either say to that individual, with all of this, here is the best recommendation or with all of this, I'm actually going to recommend to you, we don't follow any of that and here's why. So making an independent decision on behalf of an independent patient sometimes means that that primary care physician stands directly in front of all of what we're supposed to do and says no. Because, and that's our job and that's kind of fun, but you have to have crazy confidence to do that. So, so making an independent scientific decision, doing something against the grain, prescribing the antibiotic you're not supposed to use, advising against a treatment because the patient's 89, when the specialist says, well, we can cure this cancer, and the patient says, but if we cure my cancer, I can't golf for the whole next year, and it's not worth it to me. Like, sometimes we, it's almost like the old Tiananmen Square picture, right? We family physicians stand right in front of everything that makes sense because we're defending the needs of the individual as expressed to us. In the same way, and, and, and to do that, you have to be supported as a physician. You have to believe that everyone you work with has your back, believes in you, believes in your training. And in an employed environment, everything is questioned. Will you redo this note? Are you sure? No, I can't give you more than 15 minutes. Why do you need to see Mr. Jones again? Why did you send that medicine in? We need a prior authorization, right? So saying no, saying we're doing it this way because this is what's in the best interest of this patient, this is what I would want for myself becomes an act of defiance. And the biggest way a physician says no is when they say, not only am I not going to be employed by a big system, but I'm gonna be employed by myself. And actually the business model that I've realized for me that's the simplest, the one I believe I can create and sustain, the one that allows me to take care of people on my terms in their best interest is saying no to third party payments. It's saying no to the entire model that our, most of our country buys into because this model is hurting people. Yeah. So, so what's so funny is um, we've been called, like direct primary care doctors have been called evangelistic. And it is, it comes back to that bad relationship thing. You don't know how bad it is until you stepped out. Sort of like my obese patients who get fit and they're like, not even the, the old me could convince the new me how much better it is. Like, so independence, making independent decisions, making decisions that go against the grain because in your heart you know that's the right thing to do, are they defy what we're supposed to do. And, um, all of that is a recipe for an amazing primary care physician is someone who's willing to say, I'm going to protect the care delivery construct so much that it might mean I'm looked at as like a rebel, right? Like we're the rebel alliance or something because we, we will not, we will not live on the Death Star anymore. I'm sorry, but it, it, we are kind of Star Wars geeks sometimes too. So, so yeah. So, so for me, that line was just really trying to encourage people that if they're debating independence and they're feeling uncomfortable about it, it is because they are defying what is accepted right now. And that's a scary place for people who've spent 35 years of their life following the rules. I think, you know, it just reminded me something when you said simplicity. One of my favorite quotes is there's majesty in, in simplicity. Yeah. And, and in fact, in your book, one of your quotes is, and I'll, I'll put it up on the screen, what if we could simplify, really simplify the delivery of routine medical care? And I would point out the questions are always more important than the answers, and that's a darn good question. And I clean that up. Yeah. Because I would, em I would emphasize the fact that when you get down to it, because it's so simple, people can, more people can understand it and grasp it. And what you're doing is really, you're doing effective medicine. You're doing what's right first. And then the efficiency maybe comes along later. Uh, that, I, I mean, I get- decided that caring for people is supposed to be efficient. Like, so this is, I'll do the other analogy I'll use. Is parenting supposed to be efficient? Like, we're not like, you need to be a more efficient parent. 
you know, like where you need to be more efficient pet owner. Like, where do you care for a living thing that we, any of us believe that efficiency is a standard? You know, we use factory models in healthcare and, and no one questions it. And then I stopped and I was like, the whole point of a factory is their end product doesn't vary, right? Your end, if your end product is not a variable, then you want a factory. But my end product is a variable. Humans, I hope, I never hope any of my patients are exactly the same. Um, and, and, yeah. and so, so you can, yeah, systematize supply ordering. So I always have what I need systematize how the rooms are stocked so I can find everything systematize the rotation of the nursing staff. So we always have someone in house who knows how to start an IV systematize the physician schedule. So we have great call coverage and we can plan our own lives and on and on and on, but you can't systematize anything that happens in the interaction between two people because you don't know which direction that's going to go unless the patient is acting like a robot. Like, do you have stomach pain? Yes, I have stomach pain. You know, like, but that's not what people do, right? So anyway, sorry to interrupt, but no. what was so exciting to me is to say, if I could do whatever I wanted, if we could do whatever we want, what does, what is, what do we need to actually provide medical care, primary care? And I decided, me, my brain, a willing patient with a need, and maybe my iPhone, because I really like up to date as the academic resource to help my brain. But I was like, but I, I don't even necessarily need that. Um, and that's it. So that's it. So build that. Yeah. The only thing I would, the only procedural thing I probably would add into that would be time. Yeah. With the patient. And yeah. also time. You apply some malpractice. So as a malpractice, now you need money because you got to pay your malpractice. But, but I mean, and state licensure mm -hmm. and all that. But, but really in terms of, if you look around, my, my big thing being employed was I looked around and I thought I'm paying for this. Like a portion of my salary and my patient's payments are paying for all this. And is any of this making my ability to serve my patient better? And yeah. it wasn't. That's... Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Plus, I'm really cheap, or I like good deals. So I got really mad. It's like, this is a lot of money here, and it's not doing anything good. I could spend it well, on craft projects. I, I'm Dr. Julie Gunther is on the show today, and, and I have an observation. And that is, on my Twitter feed, um, and COVID-19 is driving a lot of this, there are a lot of frustrated physicians out there, and they're venting. Mm -hmm. And with good reason, because they're getting hammered. I mean, the whole system is, get, is getting hammered. And one of the things that I find, it's, it's, maybe it's a little bit of a dark humor, but these are doctors in the old system that are absolutely freaking out over telemedicine. They're exhausted from telemedicine. And I'm thinking to myself, well, duh, you've got two or 3,000 patients on your, in your patient panel, and no yeah. wonder, and they're all calling at once. Yeah. Yeah. Versus, versus, meanwhile, the DPC community is doing helpful YouTube videos and doing <laughs> telemedicine and doing Facebook live chats and, and all this without a fuss. Imagine that. Yeah. Isn't that the kind of doctor you want? I, I want a doctor that's happy, that has a clean brain and has the ability to meet me in the space where I need care with her or his full capacity, right? I want a restored, fully able human um, because I know in that moment that person's going to be able to give the best of themselves to my need. Um, but I also know, and I have, as a physician, I have a little bit of a privilege, but I also know when or when to not utilize that person's intellectual expertise. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's interesting how I don't fault my colleagues, but I kind of do like in the sense that, um, you know, traditional healthcare still uses fax machines. Traditional healthcare is so tied up and worried about HIPAA that, that the notion, and fax machines aren't, like how are fax machines private? I mean, come on now, but no one wants to talk about that. But, but 
the notion that just like, just pick up the phone and call your patient. You know this person, they're in distress, they have a question, call them. You know, and I have to, I have to be honest, there's no compensatory mechanism for all of those models of care. So I, I don't think my colleague's primary hesitation is, hey, I'm not gonna get paid for this, but it is, it is I can get sued for this, um, and I'm uncomfortable because I've not done this before. I don't have vital signs. I don't, I can't touch it. I can't listen. I can't feel it. And when you've only interacted with people in that model, you grow, I think, with a false reassurance. You lose, you lose trust in your own clinical acumen that really the, there's very good literature that supports the vast majority of the time. The answer is within the patient's story. So, so remembering how to have a conversation where you evoke the proper questions and answers over time and then having the ability to trust yourself and to trust that patient. So telemedicine is really easy when you have the confidence to say, I did a telemedicine visit. I'm on a national platform right now just filling in and I did a visit today with a gentleman that I had to say, look, you, you've told me this one specific thing. Um, we are now outside of the realm of family medicine you need to see an eye doctor immediately and I'm going to help you and here's why. But I you know, went on a walk with my friend who's an internal medicine doc who's in the system and when he was talking about doing telemedicine, he said, you know, he's saying to me, what do you do if this patient's sick? What do you do if you don't know their medicines? What do you do? And I said, you, you get online, you look at a person, you listen to what they have to say and if you are uncomfortable, doctor person, you say, I'm really uncomfortable, this could be serious. And again, going back to earlier in the conversation where physicians have lost the ability to feel empowered to speak their mind, right? There's a lot of problems we can't solve or you don't have to solve. And when you spend time with people, you realize that just telling people, this is concerning to me, you need to go to the ER now, I'm sorry, or you need to do this. I have to tell people, oh, thank you, I thought so, I was worried too. But until you, until you bridge that gap, so, so, it, and it is, again, I don't want to ridicule, I don't want to ridicule amazing, intelligent, hardworking professionals, but it is pretty silly when a grown up is panicking about a phone call. Well, I think it occurs to me that direct primary care's advantage is that, you know, you're not doing seven and a half minute visits. You know your patients. You, can, you know how they think, you know their environment, you know their, um, I had Dr. Rebecca Barons on who, who does fourth trimester care. Yeah. Which, you know, that was news to me. What's that? Well, I learned. There's a huge gap in our healthcare system. It's, it's an interesting, it's a place where people really need help. Uh, yeah. And our system isn't structured to provide it. So, yeah. she, she goes, she, saw, she was telling me how important it was for her to go to the home and ask questions to the family. Yeah. And see what's going on. Eyeballing it. Just like family medicine was 75 years ago. Yeah. Hmm. Or the doctor knew the family, knew what was going on. She also said something else that I really, I think is, is important to point out. And there is an enormous amount of support amongst your peers in the direct primary care community. Yeah. which is rare because normally, and <laughs> your predecessor, Dr. Ryan, uh, Dr. New said, hurting doctors is like hurting snarling jaguars. It doesn't happen. But within DPC, you have, uh, granted, okay, within the community, there's always a little bit because you do have very highly trained and, and educated people who have their own opinions. But in terms of physicians that are, you know, starting out, they've read your book and now what? There's a whole community out there of really terrific docs who are, yeah, sure, give me a call, happy to help. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily happen in other parts of medicine. How cool is that? I yeah. mean, so are you getting kind of a, we have this thing with the pandemic going on. Are you getting, calls or, or emails from doctors not in the, who are not DPC that are going, hey, I kind of like this. What's, what's this community all about? So yes and no. 
Um, we actually, what's really exciting, um, about five of us in the Alliance decided that it's sort of um, an opportune time for us to release like a policy or a position, not a policy, a position paper, and just really remind people what we do and that we're out there. I think, I think a lot of physicians just, just don't know what this is all about. Um, and we've, with, within a bunch of my colleagues within the direct primary care movement, we've tried to be really mindful and be sensitive about how catastrophic this is financially for some physicians' practices, personally, professionally, because um, the last thing we want to do right now is say, ha ha, we figured this out like 10 years ago. Look at, it's, you know, this is why this model's better. But um, there's a quote, uh, and I don't know who said it, but it's um, pressure on a cohesive system makes it stronger and pressure on a non-cohesive system makes it break. And I think, I think we've all known our healthcare system is non-cohesive. Um, direct primary care as a business model is, is more cohesive um, because it can pivot, um, because most of us have micro practices or smaller practices, and most of us uh, maintain decisional authority. So if we need a new app, we get it. If we wanna learn point of care ultrasound, we do it. Um, I had a, um, the Idaho Health Data Exchange, you know, anyway, I was talking to get access to uh, in-hospital information on my patients, and I'll just never forget the tech guy I was talking to said, well, you have to have your administrator call me to get download. And I said, okay, uh, uh, the administrator's on the phone right now. What do I need to click? You know, so we are able to pivot and move quickly um, and transition. And I think that's not just what modern times demands. It's what caring for people demands. But Mm -hmm. But again, my hope, and with this interview, which I hope is timely, I hope more and more people realize that, yes, there's a huge community out there that of colleagues who want to help, who've been where doctors are, um, that this can be done. Um, and, you know, the DPC Alliance has created DPC University, and this is going to sound like a plug, but... Um, Go right ahead. Yeah, it's it, it, for a while it was a, available only to our paying members, and we just decided about two months ago to open it up to everybody. So literally, it is the mind share of like thirty of the top minds in DPC and their learnings. And um, I was one of the writers of it. It's got you know sort of abbreviated segments that I elaborated on in my book, but it's all there. It's all free. Our entire membership is online. Every single person, you know, Dr. Shooty had come forward said he'd love to be a mentor. We're all most of us figure out what we're doing because a doctor ahead of us helped us. And, and my first mentor was Dr. Josh Umber, and um, I am forever indebted to him. Um, we, you know, I've grown up and I'm kind of my own full fledged person now, but, um, but, but People I wouldn't have, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, so, so we all kind of have a pay it forward mentality, um, mm -hmm. which is, is intrinsic to actually the native culture of medicine and to the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean we do everything for free, but, but this sort of eating our, our own that has become a part of medical culture benefits everybody except physicians. As long yeah. as we're fighting amongst ourselves, we're not, we're not um, collaboratively working to be better. I think, and I wanna to touch on SparkMD, which is your practice, which is in Boise, Idaho. And there was something that intrigued me about this because I've had uh, the intrepid Dr. Molly Rutherford on. Oh, yes. Who's direct primary care, but she does addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned uh, Rebecca Behrens is doing fourth trimester. Yes. As sort of a, a niche practice within, in addition to direct primary care. And so the commonality there was Direct primary care enables them to do those things better. Yes. It's an enabler, again. So you have direct primary care, but you also have aesthetic medicine. Yes. So a little bit about that. How, how does that work? Um, because you, you've, you also mentioned um, about mental health, and I'm going to get to this in a, in a minute. Um, in some of the, the information on your website, which is sparkmd.com, will be on the screen and in the description. So I'm coming in and, okay, wouldn't be me necessarily. Um, I'm a patient coming in that I just feel like I need a little help in the aesthetic department. 
how do you how are you fitting into that as the physician how is that working how does dpc enable you to do that better for the patient so that's i mean that's an awesome question and um at the heart of all this is probably undiagnosed add and i you know i mentioned early on i am a creator i love art and pottery and music and um I do a lot with my hands. I create a lot of things, construction. So, so for a long time, I was challenged by some of my colleagues that I should do aesthetics. Um, I've always done a lot of procedural dermatology, so skin cancer removals, revisions of scars, um, and I just love it. And in direct primary care, offering that for a low cash amount, um, you know, we just took a pretty massive basal cell carcinoma, so a cancer off of a gentleman's chest, his all out-of-pocket cost was $130, and that was for two pathology specimens. The end result of his excision was probably 10 centimeters by 4 centimeters. It was pretty massive. Um, healed great. Uh, he's an uninsured guy. And so my procedural ability, which I have also trained my nurse practitioner and PA, um, I love procedures, and my procedural ability is where some of our patients in direct care really save money. Um, plus, it's a huge win when I can soak lacerations and do all these things um, that people might otherwise not, not have done. So aesthetics by a lot of traditional physicians, particularly family physicians, is seen as a bit of a sellout. It's seen as not real medicine. It's not diabetes. It's not hemorrhoids. It's not depression. It's not hypertension. It's unnecessary. Um, a, huge, a huge learn for me was that I have the skills to do it and the skills to do it well, and I love it. Um, the, the, from a business side, what has been really fun is having an established business and being a physician allows me to get loans, to get fancy equipment, to do fancy things that other people in town don't necessarily have access to. So our licensure confers some privilege, which I think it should because we have tremendous training that can create business advantage. The other thing is I have a very, very hard time marking up cholesterol medicines or antidepressant medicines or insulin. Like the drive on the direct primary care side is the tightest margin possible. There's no margin in DPC for most of us. There just isn't. It's such a tight financial model. And I'm okay with that. Aesthetics is not necessary. Aesthetics is a want for most people. Yeah. Um, and so I don't have any problem with charging appropriate rates. And there are, there are financial margins in aesthetics. Um, and for a physician delivered aesthetics, high quality physician delivered aesthetics, um, our community is not so bad with this yet, but there are a lot of communities where people are doing some pretty expansive things. And I would say they're not trained to be doing the things they're doing. So, so the aesthetics is by no means a charitable event, but what I have found and what has surprised my staff is it's exactly like primary care. We start the encounter with what brings you in, and if you had a magic eraser right now, what would you fix? What would you change? And it's not about my priorities, it's about the patient's priorities. The other fun thing that sounds really strange is it's a great opportunity to continue to work on that dialogue around value and limits. Meaning, well, I want my lips bigger, I want my lips bigger, I want my lips bigger. I'm uncomfortable doing that. I'm uncomfortable because I think your results will be unnatural. And that is not something that I want to reflect my work. Here's what I can do. What do you think? Here's what it'll cost. Is that acceptable to you? And that is a bit of a conversation we have on the direct primary care side. Um, the other fun thing is it does allow for some charitable care. So um, any of our DPC patients who are her suits, so who have facial hair issues, um, uh, we offer laser hair removal to them at no cost. And that's a little bit of a secret, but it does happen. Um, a lot of our young uh, adults with um, recurrent hormonal-based acne, we have so many more options to really eradicate that. Um, and it just gives me all the tools. So, so I wouldn't say, well, I'm, I'm evolving in my aesthetic subspecialty, but it is also instant gratification. Like filler is, sounds weird to say, it is so fun um, when you learn how to do it and you do it right because you have to honor anatomy and sterility and all these things we're already trained in and the patient comes in and you do a thing and it's different, which is totally different than trying to fix hypertension. So I said in a talk I gave recently, I said, you know, family doctors don't have to do all the hard stuff all the time. 
Like if you're called to do fourth trimester care and that's what you love and you want to do that, or you want to do aesthetics or you want to do adolescent care or you, you know, you can do, you can do the fun stuff too. Yeah. Well, a lot of it is just keeping you happy. I mean, I, I'm a patient and I really want my doctor to be well. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know what's so fun about, I don't know if this is about growing older or just about family medicine. Like to me, everything colors everything else. So I built a fence this weekend because we have a cement wall in our backyard and I don't like it. Um, and teaching my daughters how to build a fence, the principles of building the fence and using the air gun and knowing what supplies to use in cement, like, it's very similar to me trying to decide which filler will give a better jawline versus which filler will give softer lips versus like, um, anyway, I just, in my own personal life, there's a lot of things. I mean, I, sew, I get my ADD gets in the way a little bit, but everything starts to sort of inform everything else. And I would say that aesthetics, um, makes me, has given me a lot more opportunities on the primary care side, treatments of psoriasis, rosacea, pigmentation, skin cancer, scar revision. So it gives more tools, but that's not to say the justification for it is it's transforming the world. You know, it's, yeah. it's something people want. It's, it increases people's confidence and people want to get it in a place where they trust the provider. Um, and so, but it has been about me to just really enjoying the work that I can do. Well, that's, again, very important. And there's also, I would say, how many people come through the door and their, their expectations are misplaced? In other words, what's really driving this desire for change? And, and is there, an, I guess, an underlying mental issue, mental attitude yeah. or you know are they doing this for the right reasons because if you do it and discover well that didn't solve the problem you know that's part of where your training as a physician is very helpful well that's why we start we start every aesthetics encounter with you know what do you see and and what would you like to accomplish um and actually i should be Claire, what's been super interesting, so some of the aesthetics companies are all excited because we have this patient database and they say, oh, right out of the gates, you're going to sell our modality like crazy. You already have so many hundreds of people who trust you. And there's not a ton of crossover between our primary care patients and our aesthetics patients. So we literally have a clinic now that you enter the front door and on the right side is a waiting room and a bank of four rooms. And on the left side is a waiting room and a bank of four rooms. And so even though we're in the same building and we have the same owner, me, um, our direct primary care members get a discount on all aesthetic services at all times. But we are, other than we have a poster up in the room that will market whatever's going on in the aesthetic space, we are super, super mindful, um, as we are with all things, about not, uh, the direct primary care side is not a sales side. The aesthetic side has just a totally different environment, culture, um, feel and there's not a ton of crossover which is fine aesthetics is open to the public um, if from that they want to become primary care patients they certainly can but um, most of our aesthetics is being built up because people want a physician injector um, and they want a really well-trained esthetician and, and we have one of those uh, on staff you you mentioned something I definitely want to bring up and that's pricing because I think a lot of people need to understand why the model is so good. And you, correct me if I'm wrong, your rates are $79 a month for adults and $10 a month for kids. Correct. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm putting up in the screen right now uh, a little section of, of your price list. And I'm gonna have both links to the price list and also your prescription medications, okay. which yeah. you, <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty amazing when you see how little those cost. But I, I want to point something out. Laceration repairs are $20 for stitches, $30 for glue. And it seems to me that an ER or urgent care clinic cost would be a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Regardless. Well, ER would be over $900. Um, i am not sure. Urgent care, maybe three to 600 Yeah one or two of those a year, if you play softball or hardball, you yeah. know, 
I'm Pete Rose. I'm diving into home. <laughs> that didn't work out too well because I met the cleat. Okay. But I think there's something else that within this, there's complex care. It's up on the screen. And I did a show not that long ago about paying for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And the show was about where are we going to find the money to pay for all this? Mm -hmm. And up on the screen, I want people to note that there's diabetes management, hypertension management, uh, cholesterol management, and mental health and wellness. And I make the point, we've heard the term super users, which 5% drive, 5% of the population drives 50% of the spending. 20% mm -hmm. drives 80% of the spending. And I made the point that if you dig down into the numbers for super users, one of the critical missing elements, the lack of primary care. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, get, they may get a little of it, but they live in, the, in, the, in specialists and ERs. That's where they are. That's their home, so to speak. And so direct primary care seems to me, I, I, I said, look, oh, and I did the math. Uh, if we covered everyone in the United States at your prices, mm -hmm. it was $248 billion a year. Okay. I mean, you think about that for a moment. <laughs> we spend $3.65 trillion. That $248 billion a year covers care. And a lot of the super users, not all, but a lot of super users fall within that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I came up with a figure. It was, I think it was a little over a trillion dollars a year in savings. If everyone in the United States, wave a magic wand, had direct primary care, which, or let me put it to you this way. If we all had comprehensive primary care as delivered by direct primary care, mm -hmm. our costs would go down dramatically. Our care would go up dramatically we'd have a lot less angst in terms of, you know, this unknown that we have. And direct primary care is addressing some incredible issues. I mean, just diabetes management mm -hmm. alone. I mean, it's a big part of the solution. It is not the solution. It's a big part of the solution. Are you familiar with any other cost saving numbers that people can go because people like hearing that. Um, I think someone mentioned 350. Uh, there was a report that that Medicare for all would save 350 billion. And I, I heard that and I went, that's nothing. DPC can save us a whole lot more. As yeah, I think and I, one of my favorite, I, I, that's a really cool number and I haven't done something like that, but that's really cool. Um, I was asked to talk about this a little bit on N an NPR interview a couple years ago. It was a discussion about Medicare for All and what my thoughts were about Medicare for All as an independent physician. And um, what, I, what I said and what I'm going to say now is the hard part with numbers is when we talk about this, there's no price transparency, there's no cost transparency. And the consumer, whether it's your employer, your insurance, or you, has no ability to negotiate or navigate pricing. So. So we continue to try and extract savings or solutions without just having a frank discussion about the bloat inherent to our healthcare model right now. So there is more than enough money to go around for everybody for every condition they could ever possibly have. It's just being utilized in an extremely inefficient way. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I'm, I don't campaign for people to lose their jobs, but I, I do campaign for simplicity. And the reason is, Simplicity is efficient and efficiency is affordable. So, so the person who needs paid when a patient has care is the person caring for the patient. And maybe there's a little rent for the place you have to stay, but this whole notion that we can only provide care for people when they're in front of us um, is really a insurance-based construct of the last 60 years or so. Prior to that, we culturally accepted that you could kind of get healthcare anywhere. Um, so, so 
you know, my challenge with discussing healthcare transformation is I don't find very many forums where people are really willing to jump out of the cage. We want to, there's a quote, you know, we want to tape wings on a car and call it an airplane. Um, and and we, the longer we do that, the more money we're just hemorrhaging, right? So, right. so I, I firmly believe, I would love to see a healthcare system where every single person pays their primary care doctor directly for transparent service and they pay a per service amount that's a low dollar amount that covers that physician's overhead plus a little extra. And they also are pay a monthly amount, a, a retainer fee, a membership fee. That fundamentally changes what a physician is able to do for people. Um, it, and, then, and then I'd like to see a system where um, people don't go bankrupt when they have a medical catastrophe like cancer or major surgery. The interesting thing is um, I, do, I do horrible doctor math, I call it, like the biggest jerk you've ever met doctor math. Um, and if you, take, if you take the standard pricing of a total knee replacement and you take the average orthopedist and you take their average annual salary and you divide it all out, depending on how you work the numbers, it basically means that they are paid two to $4,000 for a knee replacement. And then I like to ask people, what is your ability to walk worth to you? What is the ability of the person on the other end of a saw disarticulating your leg, meaning cutting your upper and lower leg off in half, putting in a robot knee, sewing you back up and potentially sending you home the same day? What is that worth? And I think that's worth way more than, more than $4,000. But why does that cost $40,000? Yeah. Where's the 36,000 go? Oh, well, 5,000's in the knee probably. You have to pay for the device. Okay, we're at 9,000. I'd much rather pay that orthopedist $10,000, give them an extra half hour. Um, say the, you know, so, so people think where the money is going is to the provider. People, but there's so many people using money because we have such a heavily regulated delivery of care system that it's so inefficient that it's catastrophic. And I love the work of David Goldhill. That may be another place to look at some numbers because he's worked out some numbers um, in his book, Catastrophic Care, about, you know, in his example person, Tina's lifetime, I think it's $2 million that she could have access to if she wasn't paying premiums for her whole life. So, so we have to start having these conversations. We have, and more than these conversations, we have to start to be willing to radically change how we pay for healthcare. Um, and I, I encourage people to think of two systems, the system that takes care of everything that won't kill you and the system designed to prevent things from killing you. And I mean in short order. So my job is, yeah, all the things that are gonna kill you long-term and all the routine stuff going on that disrupts your ability to live a good life. And then we have hospitals and hospital systems for gunshot wounds, cancer, trauma, like the I'm not going to make it 48 hours if this isn't addressed. And I think we can separate how we pay for those two things. I think sure. we can separate how we pay for those things. I agree. That's, that's an important lesson for people to learn. Um, Spark MD is located in Boise, Idaho at 2402 West Jefferson Street. And the website address is sparkmd.com. Dr. Julie Gunther, author of Sparks, Start Fires, A Guide for Dreamers Who Are Also Doctors. Great title. Thank you, and what a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and your persistence and your brain and um, putting this out there and advocating for all of us. Um, and I need to read your book. It's exciting. So I, I will send it to you in its... I'm going to make some revisions. <laughs> Because I, I've been learning, you know, I've been doing these interviews with, with these great experts and people who have such a passion about things. Candace Lehrman, who's got a rare disease. She was on last week and I learned an enormous amount from her. Um, so I am going to revisit a few things based on what I just heard today. Uh, the ownership of the relationship and just making sure I've got that nuanced correctly. Yeah. Or maybe not nuance, but make it clear that well, this sounds harsh, but you know you can and you can use this if it serves you. But um, in terms of patients, your health is your problem. It's nobody else's problem. But I mean that may sound harsh, but um, yeah, I think I, I, I get what you're saying. It's yeah. it, it, the, we're the consultants. Here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I see myself as an educator, advocate, and consultant who with compassion tries to offer people as many choices with the proper information as we can. 
but thereafter it's the patient's role to make decisions and and accept the outcome of those decisions um and to create a team they believe in so anyway yeah. i could talk all day so could you and i thank you so much i really appreciate your time well thank you and and for winning healthcare food fights without the mess i'm hunter schultz stay healthy wash your hands a lot and there you are Thank you.